We are starting a brand new series today as we look at uh, this series um, called Uncomfortable. But the, the reason it's, be, it's called that is because the, the next eight weeks we'll be looking at aspects or values that as Christians we hold dearly to, but realistically from a world perspective they're very uncomfortable. And we could be, or people could be forgiven for think or not understanding what that's all about. And um, but I want to encourage us this, this series to think about in light of what others might see this as. And this morning we're talking about uncomfortable grace. It's an aspect of Christian living, and there it's uncomfortable because. Not only grace, but the next eight weeks will go. They, the, the aspects go against our natural instincts. That doesn't often feel fair. It seems a bit weird, and uh, they cause us to feel uncomfortable, especially when we're talking with other people about it, because it just is uncomfortable, because it touches nerves. And those nerves begin to stand on end, particularly when we're talking with people that maybe don't understand things the way that you do. But they do reflect the heart of God. And I think whenever we start to talk about God stuff with people who are not familiar with that sort of talk, people get their nerves raised a little bit, their hairs raised on the back of their neck sometime and wonder where it's going to go. And if there's a takeaway for this entire series... It is that God cannot and will not be put into a box that we create. He's far bigger than what we could ever think about or imagine. There is nothing that God cannot or will not do to make sure that you and I become part of his kingdom. In fact, he has done an abundantly more than you and I would have even considered normal. And perhaps that even can cause some uncomfort as we think about what he has done for us. And along with with that kind of thinking comes the preconceived understanding is is that we kind of think what God expects. And I'm not sure that we can always do that. But I do believe that God wants us and desires more than anything else that we will come to an understanding of who he is and come in our, settle in our own heart a desire of what we could and should be. So he wants us and he needs us. And I pray this morning that as we go through this message, <coughs> excuse me, called Uncomfortable Grace, that we will begin to experience a little of what God has in store for us. And even if you've been in church for a long time, this can be awkward to think about because realistically we are called to do the same kinds of things with our neighbour. So turn with me if you have your scriptures, if you don't it will be on the screen behind me uh, to Matthew chapter 20 to where Jesus is telling a parable. This is a parable that he told to a group of people who he was with on the side of the Jordan River. It was a parable, a parable that Jesus told to illustrate a spiritual concept. In fact, all parables are that. A parable is, a, is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And so Jesus told this parable to illustrate something very spiritual that he wanted his people to understand. So Jesus is out talking with these people on the side of the river and he tells them this story. He says to them, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire labourers for his vineyard. Now when he had agreed with the labourers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard and he went about the third hour, sorry, and he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go out into the vineyard and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Again, he went out about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle and said to them, why have you been standing here idle all day? And they said to him, because no, (coughs) excuse me, the frog's got to get out soon. (coughs) 
They said to him, because no one hired us. He said to them, go, you also go into the vineyard and whatever is right, you will receive. So just so that we're on un, understanding what this parable is about, a denarius is what the man, the landholder, said he would pay the first group of people. He said, if you go out into my vineyard, I will pay you a denarius. That was a standard day's wage for that time. So we need to understand that if you put that into our culture and into our time frame, think about what the average day wage is. That's what he said he would pay them. So they would agree to that. And most of us would agree to that same sort of thing. So what happened in the story is that the first workers were told that and they went out and they were quite happy to do that. And then the story goes on that there were other workers who were found later on in the day who, who were standing idle is what the parable says. And it's inferred that it was a time where they just said, you go and work and we'll pay you what is right. Jesus never, the landowner never said that he would give them a denarius or anything. And they probably, in all hindsight, thinking, would not have expected the, him to be paying them a full day's wage if they only worked half a day. And so they went and did what they were supposed to do. And they were all in agreement with all of this. It's important that we know that the first group were in agreement right at the start because the rest of them were just told that they would get paid for what is right and everything is fine, all the workers do their part and then something happened. Because what happens after that is when the evening had come and the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, call all the labourers in and give them their wages, beginning with the last that were hired to the first. And then those who came who were hired about the 11th hour, they each received a denarius, a day's wage. But when the, fir the first came, they supposed that they would receive more. And likewise, they received a denarius. And when they had received it, they complained against the landowner, saying, these last men have worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the heat of the day. But he answered to one of them and said, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way, and I wish... I wish to give this last man the same as you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is it your evil eyes because I am good? Or sorry, is your eye evil because I am good? So the last will be first and the first will be last so that many are called and few are chosen. Uncomfortable kind of stuff if you want to think about that because the landowner is totally right when what he talks about in regards to what is his belongs to him. He's able to do whatever he wants, but it does not seem fair. Most of us would agree with that. If you worked a day's wage, you would expect that you should be paid more. How would you feel if you did work all day and received a, the same amount as someone who had worked just one hour? You'd feel hard done by. We'd feel angry, frustrated. In fact, I'm sure that we would pre feel pretty pinged off. Pinged is a spiritual word for not happy, Jane. Okay. But the point is, they were paid what they, were agree they agreed to. It doesn't seem fair that those who came to work late and maybe only worked in the cool of the day, remember that, the end of the day is the cool part, would receive the same amount as those who had worked all day through the heat of the day and did the bulk of the work that was required. And what we have just read, that parable that Jesus told, is an example of grace. As uncomfortable as it is, and that is what the spiritual meaning behind this whole story that Jesus wanted the listeners to understand. It was an earthly story, a, a, a human story, but it had a spiritual meaning. And he wanted them to hear this uncomfortable grace that was given by the landowner. The landowner represented God himself. 
And the, volu- and the workers, not volunteers, they were workers who were representing those he had called to work, to do the things that he's called them to do. So some are called at, if you want to put this into context a little bit, it could be read in this light that if you are young, you are called to work for your entire life and God has called you at a young age and you do what you're called to do. But maybe God has called some and you've only just answered the call because you've been living your whole life and it's the 11th hour. I'm not saying you've got one hour to live, but maybe that's at the end of our lives and God is still placing his call on your life. He's calling us to come. And the good news is that God's grace is at work and whatever reward is there is reward for all who answer the call, not just for those who answer it when they're young or who've been there all day. There is no greater blessing in grace because God's grace is above all things, is enough for us to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, I don't want us to think that there's no benefit in coming to the Lord in our young age because there is. But in regards to the kingdom of heaven, we are all eligible to get into the kingdom of heaven at regardless of what time we accept the call to come into the, into the vineyard and work. Our reward to be in the kingdom of God is not determined by how much we do or how long we have been doing it. Our wages in eternal life or for eternal life or our eternal life with Jesus Christ in heaven. And no matter how long we have lived as a Christian, the reward is the same and that makes us feel uncomfortable at times. It's not fair. That's what grace is all about. And grace is receiving something that we don't deserve. And you don't deserve any kind of grace. I don't deserve any kind of grace from God because there is nothing that I can do to earn it at all because it is far greater. The payment that is needed in order for me to deserve it is non-existent. But that's the definition of grace. God gives us something that we really don't deserve. It's similar to another word that we hear at times and that is mercy. But mercy is, is slightly different because mercy is not getting something that we do deserve. Think about it in relation to your children. If you those who have children as parents, there are times when we show grace to them by giving them something that they don't deserve just because we love them. We've all done that. They've been a rat all day, they've been painful, and yet you give them a hug at the end of the day. You, you shower them with love, even though they may not have deserved it today. But because of grace and our intense love for our children, we do that. That's called grace. They might not even known it was coming, but it was still there. Or perhaps you caught them in an act of doing something that they knew that they were doing was wrong. Now, I don't know that there's ever a child that's done anything really wrong. I've never seen one. Um, That's tongue in cheek because we all do things that are wrong. And you'd already warned them, do not do such and such or there will be consequences. And you children, and we're all children by the way, we've all heard that from our parents. I can remember digging a piece of toast out of the toaster with a knife one day. I got yelled at and slapped and I couldn't understand why. Then I became an electrician. Then I understood. (laughs) That was before the days of circuit breakers. Showing mercy in that case would perhaps be not giving them the full amount of punishment that they would deserve. That's showing mercy, that we don't give them what they do deserve. And I want us to understand this morning that the scriptures tell us that God is a gracious and merciful God and he loves to do 
good things for his children. He has laid out the conditions of what he expects us to do, but the problem is there is no one who is able to do what he has asked us to do. We've all fallen short. Romans 3 tells us that all have sinned, all have fallen short of what God expects, of God's glory. So in other words, we've been given the conditions by which we must live, but not one person in all living history, bar Jesus Christ himself, has ever lived a life that is worthy of this scripture. We could, I'm sorry, we all have sinned, all have fallen short. So none of us deserve the reward of heaven, not the best person in the world, not anybody. In other words, there is no one who has ever been able to do the work that God has in store for them at the level that he expects because we've all blown it. We've messed up by disobeying God's word and the problem is we are born like this so we have no hope of getting into the kingdom of heaven. There's not one person who has a chance unless something significant happens and it's not what we do. We are born with a bias toward doing what is wrong. The Bible calls it sin. You do not have to tell your children or teach your children how to say the word no. They learn it. But you do have to teach them to do what's right. You don't have to teach them to be naughty. You have to teach them to do with right, what's right because we are all born with a bias to do what's wrong. And that's what the Bible calls or sin when we disobey the word of God. And Romans 6 tells us that because of that or the sin, because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, there is a payment for sin and the wages of sin is death. In other words, the reward for disobedience is death. Not just a physical death, but a spiritual and eternal death where we will not have peace at all, where there is no hope of ever living eternally in the he in kingdom of heaven after we have died at all. So when we put that into perspective from a world perspective, we've all sinned, there is no hope, the payment for sinning is spiritual death and hell and damnation, if you want to use that terminology, or separation from God, and that's that. Welcome to our world. Do you wish you'd never been born? If that were the end of the story, we would have no hope, but that's not the end of the story, and that's where the good news, and that's why this book is called The Good News, because it is, there is good news. If that's where it stopped, what would be the point of ever trying to live up to God's standard? If there was no hope in the end of life, if there was no glorious heavenly kingdom to look forward to, why would we even try and do anything? Can you imagine what our world would look like if no one tried to be good? No one did anything good. We wouldn't want to go to school. Why would we want to go to school? Why would we want to learn? Why would we want to be nice to our parents or teachers or be kind to one another? Why would we ever consider doing stuff that was going to make people feel good if there was no purpose in all of that at the end, unless it was going to give me some benefit. It would be a very selfish kind of world. But thankfully, God is not a God who, who is so mean and nasty and judgmental that he says, okay, I'm just going to let you all rot in hell. Because 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 tell us, tells us that he, God, is not willing that any should perish, but all would come to the point of re repentance. He doesn't want us to go to hell. He wants us to be in the kingdom of heaven. So God's heart is that even though he knows that all have sinned and fallen short, and even though he knows that the wages of sin is death, he wants us in heaven so there is something that needs to happen and that outlook while it may look grim 
could very well be the beginning and it is the opening for some good news for us is that God has put a pathway in place for you and I so that we, no matter what we have done, where we have been, how bad we have been thinking, acting, living, how old or how young, whatever we have done, God has put a pl- thing in pl- something in place for us where he extends his grace, something that we do not deserve, but he extends it to us nevertheless. And Romans 6, 23, the end of that verse, it says the wages of sin is death, but it goes on and says there is a free gift available to everyone who is willing to receive it. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ or in Jesus Christ our Lord. That is the good news because if Jesus Christ or the pathway through Jesus Christ was not available, we would not have any kind of hope. It's God's grace that has been extended to you and I through Jesus Christ that we might come into the kingdom of God and be part of the family of God. But there's a problem even with that in some ways because like any gift, the gift doesn't automatically become yours just because it's available. It's only yours when you accept it. There can be a gift here with your name on it, but it can stay there for indefinitely unless you come and receive that gift. It never actually becomes yours. And that's the, that's the, the step that we need to take. God has offered us this free gift of grace. And it's our, ours for the taking. It's a free gift. It doesn't cost us anything. We didn't deserve it. But if we don't want to accept it, that's our choice. But the gift is still there for us to receive it indefinitely until we leave this earth. There is a way for us to still be able to be in the kingdom of heaven and it's by receiving this grace and the scriptures talk about it by a a term called being born again. What does that mean? Well, John 3 is where Jesus talked about that with a young man called Nicodemus. He, he was a Pharisee, a religious leader. And he was scared of his fellow constituents because the Pharisees did not like Jesus very much because he was teaching the people things that actually were not against what they were saying but against what they were doing. And so they they felt that Jesus was actually going to take away some of their rights. And so they worked out ways that they could deal with that. And eventually they put him on a cross. But Nicodemus was one of those Pharisees. And he came to Jesus one night because he was scared of what his friends might do. And so he came to him one night and said to Jesus, he says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born again? Good question. What does this born again phrase mean to someone who's never heard it before? And understanding what being born again is is really key to accepting the free gift that's been made available to us. And Jesus said to Nicodemus, he said, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So what Jesus was saying is that, he said, if we want to be in the kingdom of heaven, we must be born again. We must be living a life that's, or or stop living one kind of life and begin living a different kind of life. It's a spiritual birth, like Nicodemus was, was kind of thinking in a physical sense, but it was a spiritual sense that Jesus was speaking 
So it's not about re-entering into your mother's womb. You know that's impossible. I know that's impossible. But when we talk about being born again, it comes about by a decision to believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour and our life as we know it ceases to be the same. We are given a second chance at life, if you want to put it that way, where we receive the free gift that Jesus has of extending his grace to us. We receive that into our life and our life will never be the same again after we accept that. It's available to every single one of us. John 3, 16, perhaps one of the most learned and most memorized or widely known Bible verses in all of history and the entire scriptures, John 3 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Verse 17 goes on to say, say, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. And 18 says, he who believes in him is not condemned. But he who does not believe is already condemned or condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. And this is the condemnation. This is, this is where we're going to. The light that has come into the world, Jesus Christ, and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come out into the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth (coughs) comes into the light and his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. In other words, Nicodemus as a religious leader, a Pharisee, was hearing Jesus say that being religious is not enough. It's not enough to say I'm a religious person because that isn't enough. The Pharisees were extremely religious. And Jesus used a term for them, he said they're like whitewashed tombs. Look good on the outside, but their inside are rotting. So being religious is not enough. Going to church is not enough. Reading your Bible is not enough. Even praying is not good enough. Being a good person is not good enough. Helping little old ladies across the street is not good enough. Carrying someone's groceries to the car for them is not good enough. Not stealing is not good enough because none of those things will ensure that we are in the kingdom of heaven. They're all good things to do and we should do them, but they're not the things that are going to get us into the kingdom of heaven. If we live our lives being religious, we've missed the point of what Jesus was saying. There is more to it than just doing the right thing. It's about being the right person. So the question that really is there is how can we be born again? How can we, what happens when we accept this gift? How can I receive this free gift that's been available to me? And it's been available to you for your entire lives, but it's not always recognised that. We might be walking around idle in our world, doing what we think's right, doing all the things that we're supposed to be doing, but there comes a time in your life when, when the landholder will, or the landowner will come and knock and say, what are you doing? And you say, well, no one's said anything to me. No one's called me. And he'll say to you, I want you to answer the call now. It might be the 11th hour for us. In a, in a world context, it could very well be the, le, the, the 11th hour. But in yours and my life context, I have no idea how long God is going to leave us here on this earth, this planet. But I am confident that there is a limited amount of time for every single one of us. And that came to a reality this week as we 
sent off June in, in her funeral on, on Friday. So how can we be born again? I think the first step that if you want to receive the free gift that Jesus has on offer for us is to really acknowledge him as the Lord and Saviour. The scriptures tell us that we must acknowledge our need of a Saviour. We need him. And if we don't acknowledge him, then we are going to find ourselves in a place where it's going to be not very nice for us. And that's what Jesus is speaking about in John chapter 3, what we read before. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is already condemned. In other words, we need to live our life without condemnation. Romans 8.1 tells us there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So we can live our life free from the bondage or the condemnation or the burden of weight upon us knowing that we have eternal life with Jesus Christ when we acknowledge him as our Lord and Saviour. Secondly, to be born again, to receive the free gift of eternal life, we confess and when we admit to Jesus Christ or admit to God that we have been sinful, that we have not been obedient to him, that we have lived a life that has ignored him, the Bible does not just tell us that we need to hear that, but we need to live that. And it tells us also that Jesus just doesn't hear that we want our confession to him, but he forgives us as a response to that. He wants us to live a life that is free from sins. 1 John 1 9 says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So it's, it really is about confessing. I know for some, that might feel a little uncomfortable telling him about our sinfulness and how bad I've been. I tell you something else, uncomfortable as it is, it is much more or much less comfortable, um, less comfortable not doing it. It is a step of faith. Maybe we feel uncomfortable when we think about why would Jesus be willing to forgive me of things that I have done. You have no idea how much I have done wrong in my life. You have no idea what kinds of things that have happened to me, the things that I've said, the way that I've lived my life. How could Jesus ever forgive me? might make you feel a little uncomfortable, but I want to tell you this morning, there is no sin, no depth to which you have fallen that God's hand will not reach. And he will forgive. And he has forgiven. And if we confess with our mouth that he is Lord, if we seek him, he hears us and he responds he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin. And he will and cleanse us to the point where we are whiter than snow. It's, it's, this is what Jesus was speaking about. It really is not about when you receive this gift. It's, that's so important, by the way. It's... It's that you receive the gift. <clears throat> it's more important that you receive it, not about when. But the problem is we don't know how long we have got. And so in that sense, there is a sense of urgency. So it's possible to believe in Jesus Christ when you are a 10-year-old child, for instance, or believe him in him for the very first time in your 80s or 90s or beyond. The reward is still the same. The kingdom of heaven is there. You get to be in the kingdom of heaven. The difference is that if you make your decision as a young person, you get to experience the peace that God brings into your life for your entire life while you're living on earth as well. He helps you through all those things that are difficult. He gives you courage and strength and boldness to do what's right. We just need to trust him. The difference is giving him our lives when we're young as we get to spend our whole lifetime 
giving praise and honouring his name. And I have spent some time speaking with older people who have given their lives to Jesus for the first time in their old age. And that's one of the regrets that they do have, that I wish I'd done it when I was younger. I wish I had lived my life differently. I feel like my life has been wasted. So if you're a young person here this morning, don't put it off until you get old. Some of you won't get old. And if you're an older person here this morning, don't put it off. You're at the wrong end of life to be putting off things too long. And whatever end that is, I'm not criti criticising age at all. It's just a reality of time. And you and I both know that. We get to experience the peace of God now. So whatever age we're at, let's, let's receive this gift. Let's acknowledge him and confess our sin to him. And thirdly, the scriptures tell us that we need to repent. And repentance is a conscious decision to stop doing what is wrong and to begin to do what is right. It's more than just being sorry. We can be sorry and not really change anything. You, you've said to your siblings, I'm sorry I hit you on the head with a block of wood. And you didn't mean it. You intentionally did, well, whatever. You did that because you were mad at them. You're sorry you got caught and you're sorry your parents saw it and you're sorry to the point where they say, say sorry to your sister or say sorry to your brother and you say, I'm sorry, but we don't mean it. And that's not what we're talking about when we talk about repentance. It's being sorry enough that we do not want to do that again, that we will turn around the word repent is to do a 180 turn, to stop doing what's wrong and to begin to do what is right. It's an essential part of being born again because it's, the, it's signifying that we no longer want to live the way that we were, but we've now been born again. We have a new life. We're going a different direction. It's easy to say sorry, but we shouldn't just be sorry we've got caught. Repentance is a heart desire to actually change our behaviour. And because of repentance, our lifestyle will change. We will want to be with fellowship, in fellowship with other people. We will want to be reading our Bible. We will want to be praying. We will want to be doing good things. We will want to be helping little old ladies across the street and helping people put their groceries into their cars because of the change that has been done in our lives, not to get us into heaven, but because we are already going. That's the difference between works and, and faith, between our life as it was and being born again. Acts 3 says, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins might be wiped out that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. And can I tell you that when that happens, when we, can, when we repent, it's like God lifts off a weight off your shoulders and you will never have that experience any other way. It's a change of mind about our sin. It's seeing God or seeing sin in the way that God sees sin. Understanding that unless we deal with sin, in our life, God is unable to allow us into the kingdom, no matter how good of a life that we have led. His grace is there, but his, he is a just God too, and he will fulfill the things that he said. It's a change of mind about Christ. It's recognizing that he is the one who has made it possible for us to be forgiven. When Jesus was put on the cross, he took the punishment for yours and my sinfulness upon himself, a man who had not sinned, but took the punishment. What was the punishment of sin? Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. And he took that upon himself. He was hung on a cross. The scriptures actually describe and talk about it and say, well, and, and some of the soldiers there were saying, well, if he was the son of God, why doesn't he get himself down? The reality is he could have, but if he did, then he would not have been able to pay the price. He was there to pay the price because of his great love for you and I.
Jesus was put to death and his blood was shed so that you and I could have forgiveness from sin. Fourthly, we are to believe not just that he exists, but in who he is, the Son of God, that he is the Son of God, that he has paid the full price of your sin. When he died on the cross, he paid the price that you and I could not pay. And he says, I'll take the punishment. I'll take the punishment for what you've done wrong. And I'm extending to you grace. So that any who believe in my name, all who confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, those who receive me into their life, who are born again, will experience the kingdom of heaven Even though we did not deserve it, we get to experience it because of God's love and he's extended his grace. It's uncomfortable thinking about it, but it's true. John 3, 3. One of the verses that June actually asked us to read at her funeral says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. And fourthly, we need to receive. As we said before, the free gift really doesn't become ours unless we receive it. John 1.12 says, Yet to all who have received him, to those who believe in his name, he gave us the right to call him or to become children of God. He's our heavenly father and we're his children. And if you've never experienced firsthand the power of Jesus Christ in your life, then I encourage you to not put it off any longer maybe you have experienced that in some past time and and you realize that I've not been really walking the what the way that I should have it's today's the time if you sense that nudge it's him knocking revelation 3 20 tells us that here I am and it's Jesus speaking here I am I'm standing at the door and I'm knocking if anyone hears my voice Open and opens the door, I will come in. So if you are sitting in our room or listening online this morning, then you experience this nudge in your spirit inside of you that says, I really need to do something, but I'm too scared. Can I suggest that's the knock on the door of your life and you need to just say, open the door and see what happens. It's uncomfortable because... Some of us might have to acknowledge something that others have thought of us for a long time. Maybe, maybe you've been coming to church for, for 50 years, but you've never really received Jesus into your heart the way that he's calling us this morning. And you're worried about what others are going to be saying or thinking. Tell you what, if you refuse to do something, then you may well be locking the door off for your opportunity to be into the kingdom of heaven because there is only one way into heaven and is that through Jesus Christ. It's a promise. If you open the door, he will come in. If you are sincere about it, he will come in. And as I said before, you will experience a weight being lifted off your shoulders like you have never experienced it before. Because when we invite him in, he takes all our sin. He takes what has been burdening us down, weighing us down. And he cleanses us. All the guilt is gone. We've still done wrong stuff, but he removes the guilt. He's paid the price. We're we're still at fault, but God has removed the guilt from that. All fear is taken away. And he replaces it with a peace that is greater than I could ever explain. It may feel a little uncomfortable doing that. It might feel a little uncomfortable believing that God could forgive you because of the things that you've done. But Ephesians tells us, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, not from yourselves. It is a gift of God. In other words, it's not by works It's not by doing good things so that no one can boast. I can't just do stuff and say, well, I've done better than you because I've done more than you. It's by faith. It does not matter how many good things that you have done. They will never be enough to get you into the kingdom of heaven. The only way is that we are born again. As Jesus told Nicodemus, it's a free gift. 
that comes through the work that Jesus Christ did on the cross and it's freely available to every single one of us this morning. And I want to make sure that you have taken up the offer of the free gift and received it for yourselves. Can we just close our eyes and bow our heads as we close off? And I, I don't know where you are all this morning. I suspect I do in some cases, but only God knows what you, what's in your heart at this moment in time. And if while all our eyes are closed and heads bowed for just a moment, can if God has been saying something to you this morning, if you sense that, maybe you should just put your head up and pull it straight back down again. I just want us to be able to do that. Thank you. Don't be embarrassed about that. Don't, don't be worried about what others might think. If, if there is something in your life this morning that you need to do that's a conscious choice, while our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, hand up and hand down. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I know that you are working in people's lives in our church here this morning. And I know that the small, still voice is sometimes a little mystifying to us and difficult to comprehend, but Father, I pray that, the, that what we hear and what we sense, we might recognise and act upon, not being worried about what other people say or do. For those that have raised their hands this morning, Father, I, I do pray that you have already met the need to which they come. For those who have said, I want to receive you for the first time or acknowledge that I I've, I've need to do this again, Father, I pray this morning that they will have the peace and the understanding and the knowledge of what to do. But Father, we as a, as a family will embrace and love and not criticise, not be critical of, of who it is or what it is, and, but, but Father, that, that salvation has come. And so no matter where we stand this morning, Father, we know what we know to be true. That there is grace, as uncomfortable as it might be, available to every single one of us this morning, just for the asking. And if we accept that, we confess our sin, we turn from our wickedness and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you tell us, that eternity in heaven is ours. So may your hand be upon each one. May we experience the presence of you in our lives, Father, from this point forward. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.